sorry. Uh, what I had realized is that uh, our panel has been working on AI for a long time, <laughs> not, not just when it is like cool in the last few years. Uh, so let me start with Gautam. Uh, so the Gautam is, uh, he's author of the book, Leading with Empathy. And uh, he's a long-term leader trying to create value within uh, organizations and has a lot of uh, working on a lot of AI use cases. So I was talking and he was, um, he was mentioning this in very interesting use case about like using AI to help leaders and many others. And then we have Ivan. Uh, he is uh, CEO of Ola. Uh, most of you may know it's a it's a API security API and app security platform. He'll talk about it more. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and we have uh, Shanil. Uh, he is the CTO and Chief AI Officer at uh, Cut and Dry. It's an e-commerce platform for food service distribution, online ordering, payments, etc. Uh, so. Very interestingly, I found uh, Ivan's article on 2017 talking about how to apply AI within the products, almost eight years. And Shanil writing about AI in 2019. So we have a panel that has been doing. Uh, very interestingly, that's the time period that it went down, not the most yeah. cool time. So. Okay, so let's get started. So I'll start with uh, Ivan. So, uh, so, so we we have LLMs, right? But could you talk a little bit about how how to distinguish LLM use cases and what we had before and how it's been applying, uh, like uh, uh, what's happening right now? Okay. Yeah, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, yeah, let's talk about LLM a bit. So that's specifically related to what you said, you know, like AI was kind of on, on the top of the people mind specifically from this, you know, startups perspective back in 2013, you know, like all was about AI and then, it, you know, went down a bit and then went up. So what specifically happened is LLM, right? Large language models. Uh, first of all, I mean, it's, you know, like kind of first and probably the only um, way that everyone not even related to, you know, technology can, you know, interact with the model because it's native and it's operate native language, basically native, I mean, human language, right? And the model itself, it's as large as as many languages as you can I mean, talk yourself than the same amount of language that the model can talk, right? Because of that, um, pretty much everyone, even not involved in tech, right, start to enjoy that AI stuff, right? And that's specifically what happened. And then to the LLM, why it's, you know, so broad by use cases, why it's so, you know, um, <clears throat> I mean, distributed, in other words, right? In other words, it's everywhere right here right now, right? Because the this way how we think, you know, as a human being, right, it's the language itself, right? When we start to put some associations and then try to explain what we see, we use the language, the fundamental stuff. And if you ever, you know, studied the computer science, the first thing you, you got there is, you know, the Chomsky grammars, the grammars itself, like the theory of compilers and stuff. It's exactly the same thing, right? So we found, finally found a way how to operate was essentially the same. And, in this, in this context, language is not like, I mean, the, the language that we all speak, right? It's also a very, I mean, concrete and solid, you know, object in, in mathematics, right? So it's something that's very defined. And now we have, like, the first time the way to communicate with, you know, kind of artificial way of that and what we have. Uh, in, in our daily life. So that's what specifically happened. That's why LLM is so unique, why it's so, I mean, distributed, and why it's, you know, so useful, because essentially you can, once you operate, right, you're doing just two things. You're just, like, presenting some sort of the language, even if it's, you know, manipulated by your hands or you just pronounce it by, by, by your mouth or tongue or whatever, 
uh, or even like impress some emotion. So it's still the language, the body language, another language. In other words, how to encode data into some, you know, some sort of like metaform to then send to others and then they interpret and reverse it back, right? That's what we face now and that's why LLM is so unique. Thanks, Iran. So let me now switch to, sorry, switch to Chanel. So could you talk about some of the use cases Katendra is working on? Yeah, and sure. How do they make a difference? Sure. Uh, can you guys, this is okay, Mike? Yes. All right, great. So, um, so Cut and Dry, just a quick uh, introduction, it's a, a startup based out of San Francisco. And what we do is we, we, we are building an operating system for the entire food service industry. It's a, it, it's a, it's a large industry and it has um, a lot of data, a lot of unstructured data, right? And um, so when we started with AI, my, my partners and uh, founders uh, have been working in AI much earlier than even me. Um, but about last year, early last year, we started working on generative AI products and so on. There were many use cases, right? And I think this is, this is something that uh, happens a lot. It's very easy to build a POC on AI. Right? You can get 45, 50% accuracy and you think, wow, this is great, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but what happens is to perfect that to a product, you need to get to 95, 98% at least, right? And to be able to put it out. And that's a huge challenge, right? Uh, so we did multiple different um, uh, pr pr proof of concept, concepts, many failed, um, uh, but uh, a couple of things that really uh, worked out. One is a product that we built and it's uh, launched uh, as a beta. And we are the first company in the world in the food service industry to launch that product. It's actually a sales um, prospecting tool. Uh, and basically how it works is um, the distributors that we work with have food catalogs and they sell to restaurants, right? These are the ingredients that go into making food inside the restaurant. Um, and, and each menu item um, um, matches up to ingredients, a catalog that can be sold. So what we use is uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT 3.5, and a few other uh, frameworks uh, and models where we could, uh, uh, where we could um, train the AI on a specific catalog and then pros prospect out all the menus that are out there, let's say in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, break down those menus into ingredients and then show this distribution partner which are the best restaurants that they can sell their catalog to of food. And then actually auto-generate that uh, um, uh, proposal, send it out, track it, all, all of that, right? So it is a very, uh, very interesting product with the first to launch it. It's in beta right now. Uh, there are many other products that we have already done, but more internal efficiencies, data cleansing, uh, product matching and stuff like that. But I would say this has been the forefront uh, product that we launched. So in this one, uh, customer who come to the platform can basically upload, upload their menu and it will tell who it can target, etc. Uh, no, so slightly different. So the customers have a catalog that have, um, um, these are the products I sell. These are like, okay, it could be, you know, chicken or burger, uh, burger meats or um, let's say uh, uh, fish or all of those things, right? So typically uh, one of our distribution partners has a catalog of about 5,000 items that they sell. They can circle an area in the US okay. And we pull out all the restaurants in that area. It's the other way around. Yeah, other way around. there are a million restaurants in the U.S., right, Srinath? So these guys can't go to all these restaurants and say, okay, will my catalog sell to a, um, a coffee shop versus right. can it sell to an a Italian restaurant right. and so on. So it, it brings out all those menus, breaks the menus into ingredients, mm -hmm. and then matches the ingredients to the catalog I have and comes, comes out and say, here are the top 100 uh, uh, restaurants in this zip code that you can go after and sell. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult to do that as a human because, you, you know, you have to go to each restaurant, understand their menu uh, uh, and all of that. So uh, AI has certainly helped us. Uh, and it is a kind of a leading product uh, in, in our uh, platform right now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Very interesting. So we'll, we'll switch to Gautam. So when, when we talked, you talked about using AI to help leaders. Yeah. Could you talk about some use case, including that, but 
other you had a lot of other use cases too. yeah sure definitely um so as Srinath mentioned i've been working with ai for a very long time uh, actually chanel when you were talking about this it reminded me about how um in 2007 we were working in a smart home helping uh, people who were living in a smart home and it was about cataloging the ingredients in a refrigerator and then auto generating some of the recipes yes, exactly right yeah. and if the recipe is not available then it starts recording and stores it as a new recipe so um the, the use cases that we try to exp uh, explore are always about improving human quality of life because that's truly what we use technology for the value that technology brings is to make sure that we reduce the manual toil within ourselves and we elevate ourselves and evolve to the next level and that's why all the genai and um all the new ai use cases that are coming are really really important um so we uh, when we were talking we were chatting about some of the common ones i think you and malit talked about some of the common use cases like um in the retail industry and then afterwards in the healthcare industry especially with um uh, you know diagnosis helping reading the x-rays helping radiologists and all those various things um but when it comes to other things like workflow optimization and um trying to improve the way that we're working within organizations i'm sure you've all seen uh, corio and the way that uh, the ai assistant is helping um those use cases so you have some of those uh, but from a leadership perspective there are some really unique interesting cases um which if not implemented properly can become very very dangerous um so i'm going to give a little bit of caution out here but the first thing is um simplifying the workflows right you can the as a leader you have to absorb so much of data and you have to be making decisions really quickly so rather than waiting for someone to interpret it probably convert a static screenshot into a spreadsheet making decisions and then you lose the importance and um the context of the data you can ask in real time with gen ai um and have a conversation and try to glean information from it so that's one thing that uh, we've done that's really helpful um the other thing that i like really well is as a leader um we are put into a lot of compromise situations or situations that have a lot of conflict um so um the the example that i was giving shrinath was um i've been playing around on bedrock with this particular application that acts as a ai coach to leaders um especially because i'm more on the empathic leadership side um it provides situations and um the the leader can say hey i'm running into this particular thing how would i respond and then it starts coaching you and teaching you how to actually be much more human and the quote that i was telling shrinath is it's amusing that we are using artificial intelligence to improve humanity mm. um so those are some really unique things um there are two things i would caution um you can provide a lot of data and feed it and create reports and have the leaders make all kinds of reports for themselves but that comes with a lot of caution because if they don't understand the correlation between the data points you're going to be they're going to be cherry picking the data so that is one thing that is really dangerous you don't want to go down that route um then afterwards the other thing and this is what i tell all my leaders is do not use generative ai to please write your emails as a leader you need to be authentic absolutely and if you're not authentic and you're having someone else write it then you probably shouldn't be a leader thanks gautam so in few minutes i'll open the floor for questions from the audience so think about them i'll one more round and we'll open uh so so next questions open for all panelists so how uh, okay how do you decide the model is ready to go out ready to put out to the world could you share your experience how do you do it in your thoughts can you do it yeah sure so um i think when malit uh, presented uh, before us uh, talked about the importance of the data you feed the model right uh, and what we found was um that the data that you feed the model has to be perfect right you can't even have 1% of inaccuracy because it, it, it's like a crack in the system right if you um feed the model with um, uh, inaccurate data even 1% you're going to get results that could be wrong right so um 
Um, that, that, that's uh, something um, uh, that, that we learned, um, that you, you, you really, really need to take um, 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 a lot of time to make sure the data is uh, accurate. Uh, most of the time, we have found, even when the data is accurate, you get hallucination, you get wrong um, uh, uh, results that come out. So there's a human element that has to come in to verify everything that you um, uh, get from it before you can actually uh, put it out to market. Uh, and there's a, th there's a big gap still that needs to be filled uh, in that sense. Uh, but would you build a, like a complete train in data set and use that to get the numbers and keep going? Yes, you have to continuously increase your training data set, right? You, you can't just say, okay, this is the set and that, that, that's what it is. You can start with the model, uh, train it, uh, and then continuously improve on it. Um, I don't think you can get to almost 100%, but you can, you can get to 90, 95%. That's when fine tuning comes in, uh, the, the uh, other areas. Um, the way we have implemented our product, you, um, it gets to about 70% of accuracy in the results. After that, we have a human looking and giving it feedback. Right. That gets to 98, 99%, and then after that, you can push it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say it also depends upon the use case, right? There are some use cases that may not require that level of precision. Absolutely, yeah, right? that's true. Um, and you need to be very conscious about who are you impacting. So, for example, patient experience mm -hmm. or, you know, diagnosis of medication or trying to supplement, um, you know, the diagnosis recognition, all those things. You need to have that level of um, accuracy. Uh, accuracy that is required, and also you need to make sure that the sensitivity is really, really good. Um, so, on the other hand, when you're like doing something like workflow optimization or something, the worst case scenario is probably you got a bug or something happened in uh, internal systems, so it probably is okay to have 70-75%. So, I would say um, as you start working on your use case and you find that it is giving consistently good amount of results, with the right level of sensitivity, then you feel that you are good enough to ship it based upon your use case. But again, a lot of people don't realize that it's a continuous improvement process. Yes. It is not a one and done approach. You yeah. need to constantly be fine tuning it. You need to feed it better training data. And just because you're having AI doesn't mean that there is no human in the loop. You have much more uh, humans actually evaluating the data and assessing it so that they can teach it whether it is right or wrong. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the third thing that I would say is you need to make sure that the transparency, or you understand how the results are coming. If you do not understand how the results are being generated and you're leaving it out into the open, it's very dangerous. So I would say those are, those are three things. Yeah, um, I mean, definitely I, I agree with, with everything that you guys said. Probably just like to put some, you know, like, Instructions that uh, we have two different cases in, in real life, right? The tasks that already solved by 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 human being, right? And the new task that never solved before. So for tasks that's already solved, uh, we have some metrics, right? Some kind of scores that allow us to say that the task was solved. Otherwise, it's not solved, right? It just something, right? And then with with other things, we don't have this criteria. We don't have even how to approach this task. Right, so with the first group of tasks, ultimately we, I mean, what we did at least is to compare the, the let's say it's a customer success chat that an NPS, kind of key metric or a bunch of this metric, uh, historically with, with what we got from AI. And then we compare that, and the, the key point here is to find out that AI can solve this at least a little bit better. If it's a little bit less, then we probably stay with the current approach because you know it's very similar to what what you have you know in the construction. If you have one angle, uh, one one degree um, in the wrong direction, you can get like you know completely broken like construction and and you build more floors. That's exactly the same. You have to put this AI in the right angle, find out that even at 0.5% of improvement, but it's constantly improving itself, then you're doing right, and you can you know, reduce this people efforts here and move it somewhere here. So that's, ultimately, it's about statistics, and we're not talking about five experiments, we're talking about what, what before was defined as continuous approach, but we need like statistically proven amount of experiments and data should like tell yourself. So the other problem and the other task is like new tasks that we never sold before. So we essentially can do the same, right? We can try to, you know, 
compare one model with another and use one model as a kind of like, you know, supervisor to tell us, hey, what's your score, and then use another model or next version of the same, right, and try to compare them and find out, hey, it seems like the, these two things progress well, the next thing uh, beat the previous thing, so we're doing the right direction. So we can use this one now as our baseline as, you know, previous people score and do the same. And I was surprised how fast we can deploy, you know, practical implementations for tasks never solved before with an AI, because LLM is so universal and so, you know, um, I mean, <laughs> handy in many things, right? We can solve tasks even with, you know, very average results, but then improve it very fast and then very quickly get into the point when we found that, you know, even if solution was not found in full, but the, you know, like partial solution or, I mean, significant improvement was made and we can roll out, we can try to get kind of first results, which is, I mean, unbelievable, and sometimes even give us back the feedback that, you know, probably have to improve the task or somehow, you know, adjust initial task because we have this result, and this result itself get us back a feedback how this task should be solved, right? And what I really like about LLM, unlike all the previous things when it was like, you know, more about weights on neurons and yes and no answers, zero to 100, now we have an explanation from the model why the particular answer or decision was made, yeah. and we can use it, send it back to us, right, and discuss in a group as human being how we have to approach to that feedback, because now we know how it, you know, think, and also explain to ourselves the solution of the task, right? That's for the second group of tasks where we don't have any solutions made by human before. That's all the time we have, actually, two minutes over. So let's thank our panel. Thank you. Thank you.